The book is Conquistador. They look at Hernan Cortez and King Montezuma and a battle of a part of the world I think we were all kind of thought we knew, but uh, I know it much better after reading Buddy Levy's piece here. And Buddy joins us now. He is an accomplished author, an adventurer. He's got an awesome, awesome bio uh, that I do want to get to uh, a little bit later. But Buddy, thanks for doing this today. How are you? Ryan, I'm doing great. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just uh, popped in last night um, after doing a uh, spent two hours uh, recording an episode for History Channel on the Bohemian Grove. So this is the secret society. So this is a bit of a pivot, but uh, I'm ready to roll. <laughs> I know. I mean, the <laughs> amount of research, I just wanted to give you props on. I was going through the notes, the timelines. It was one of the first times I just remember how much I hated in school when I would have to do bibliographies and know everything and all this stuff and i was like man that must have been that must have been the least fun but it was, it was actually very helpful to the reader because there's all these different moving pieces the characters the timeline but let's get into it um let's start with who cortez was at a, as a person um the year this all started because there was this flirtation with this part of the world the new world that spain was busy trying to get involved with while uh, other people were a little further north but just who cortez was at this stage of his life Right. So uh, Cortez was um, considered a, a Hidalgo, which is uh, kind of a low level nobility. And at the time, uh, in the early 1500s, the Spaniards had already arrived in uh, Hispaniola, Cuba, the West Indies, and had sort of laid siege to these islands and were taking over and creating governorships and um, you know, turning the native peoples into slaves. And it was quite brutal. And Cortez and young men of his ilk um, knew that there was a possibility to uh, rise up through military ranks, gain fame, and also wealth and riches, because there were rumors uh, filtering around that there were uh, precious metals and such, um, and also the acquisition of land. So Cortez ends up hopping on a ship and arriving in the New World and settles in Cuba, and pretty soon is like, befriending the governor there, um, this guy, Diego Velasquez. And um, the next thing you know, uh, Velasquez has heard that there are um, small populations that, they've been, that some, some early expeditions had seen on mainland Mexico, and he decides to send um, Cortez as the leader of this uh, expedition to go find out what's going on over there. And so that was sort of the backdrop. There is some also uh, sort of sidebar stuff where Cortez and Velasquez didn't get along completely. Uh, there were rumors that Cortez had um, had slept with his uh, some other person's wife, and that was considered um, pretty bad form. Uh, he actually escaped out of a window at one point, and uh, and so Velasquez had some misgivings about Cortez, but he was an ambitious young man uh, and. You know, he was sent to lead this um, expedition to go find out what was going over on mainland Mexico from the islands. So he lands at Veracruz. Uh, are we talking what fifteen nineteen? Exactly. Right. Okay. And there's these rumors of of this inland oasis, uh, this leader in Montezuma, because as soon as they get to Veracruz, like Montezuma has people already realizing oh, these these ships have anchored and that they're setting up and um cortez very early on is like i need an audience with, with montezuma but what was understood about montezuma and the place where he was living which essentially sounds like paradise from the reading yeah well that's really interesting because um the spaniards when they arrived at veracruz they were initially um you know uh, the native population right on the on the um on the fringes on the coastline, like fought them off for a while. And so Cortez and his men are like held up on these, um, humid, hot banks of the, um, of the ocean. And, and they're, um, they end up starting, to, um, they're, they're able to defeat a few of these small groups and then continue inland. And one of the things that's really amazing, Ryan, about the, uh, their initial arrival is that Cortez lands, um, with 16 horses and you know at the time horses had gone extinct uh in mainland mexico in mesoamerica and so when or when cortez arrives and unloads these horses and begins 
um, running them up and down the beach and shooting cannons, the, um, the local population are just, it's basically shock and awe. They're like, they've never seen gunfire and they've never seen horses and they're freaking out. So they run off. Um, Montezuma hears about this. And in those days he would send runners, um, like people would run multiple marathons and from Tenochtitlan, which is over the mountains in central, in, in what is now Mexico city. And so Cortez begins to do, have correspondence with this guy through these runners who are drawing pictures of Tenochtitlan, uh, and, and he's communicating with them and sending back, uh, notes, uh, uh saying, I want to, I want to meet you, or at least explaining to to these um, people that he wants to meet them. And so the Spaniards really didn't know much about it. They didn't know much about the city. And, and the other thing that's crucial is that, um, the runners begin to bring gifts and they're, and these gifts are elaborate gold pieces. Some of them as large as like a car tire, huge gold, um, ornate, heavy gold. And so Cortez is, uh, once, once more of that. Uh, and, and keeps, and they're trying to get him to leave. And Cortez says, you know, I want to meet the main guy. I want to meet this Montezuma. Yeah. There's a couple of mistakes here early, uh, as we can go back and, and replay the results where it's like, well, you should have just run them off immediately in Veracruz. And then you probably shouldn't have shown up with gold saying, Hey, here's all this gold we have, but please don't come visit again. Um, beat right. it where I love the quote that you had from Cortez that said that essentially his people suffer from a disease of the heart, which can only be cured with gold. So <laughs> now <laughs> yeah. Cor- Cortez is like, all right. And, and you make a great point here. And, and any time I've ever looked through anything like war, a claim, the life that, that someone with no access to nobility, their only path to any kind of life beyond average is so, like all of these people coming from all over the world being like, well, maybe if I fight in this war, if I get appointed here, if I can figure this out, it's kind of like the Hamilton model. Um, right. Hamilton was, was a brilliant person and they knew that he needed to go to America to look, but, but in a very quick amount of time, he completely stands out in Washington. And the next thing you know, I mean, he's on off and running. So whenever I think about Cortez, he's thinking, well, I have nothing to really live for, even though it's not like he's a commoner, as you pointed out, like he is so incredibly single-minded he is so driven throughout this entire story and all these times you think everybody else would have just given up at this point he does not now once he's determined to get to montezuma um and to nochtelan what happens with the burn the boats quote because i was waiting for that moment is it fair to say that burn the boats is is right in theory but the accuracy is not 100 percent? yeah that's true so um after some of Cortez's men are becoming uh, weary of all of this, right? So they don't have the same opportunities that their leader is going to have. You know, they're they're just uh, soldiers, and so there's like 500 of them, and there's a bit of uh, dissension, right? And so after they're encamped there, and Cortez says, you know, we're going over the mountains to this place that none of us have ever been. Um, some of the men start to say, actually, we want to go back to Cuba. We're, we're out of here, you know, and there's because there were allies, uh, right? There were there were a yeah. lot of people that were actually more had more allegiance to the guys back in Cuba than even Cortez, correct? Exactly, and he's kind of gone rogue. In fact, he slipped off uh, under cover of night, really. Um, but at any rate, they um, Cortez realizes that he may have a, a kind of mutiny on his hands, and so um, it comes down through history that he burned the boats. But what he actually did is he sent some of his men. Uh, and they're like 11 ships. Um, and he sent some of his men to go bore holes in the bottoms of the boats and he sinks them. And at this point, there they are on the beach. The ships have sunk and there's no going back. Cortez basically says, we're, I'm going to go meet this guy. We're heading, we're moving forward or we're going to die. That's it. I mean, it's pretty bold. It's brazen, you know, it's just really ballsy. So. What I also love about this story is just the sheer numbers that we'll get to later when we talk about, you know, two of the most significant battles of this this timeline. But uh, where Cortez on his way to Montezuma is going to stop by all of these villages, you know, populations where I think, you know, some are really small all the way up to like maybe a couple hundred thousand people. It, It would sound like from from how large some of these outposts were. And when he shows up, he's in incredibly um manipulating he's very 
I think he's just smart. He's a politician on top of being this military genius, which I think is, is actually fair to say, considering the success that he has. Um, but he needs numbers. He needs sheer numbers. He needs allies. And it sounds like there was a lot of people that were more than willing to sign up with him, not based on fear, but wanting to get revenge on Montezuma and what the main like focal point of this this region was all about. So take us through that a little. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I'm glad you brought that up. And Cortez, uh, you're right. I mean, I would a great manipulator, um, you know, uh, incredibly politically savvy, uh, ambitious, and also um, really good at creating allegiances. So what ended up happening is that at one of these villages, and and by the way, you know, he would come in there, um, immediately raise their temples, which were, you know, uh, they were uh, the temples that they prayed to their gods, of which there were many, and then immediately put up a cross and say, by the way, Spain now owns this and um, you have to bow to the king. Now, this didn't always go over very well, but <laughs> one of the things that he noticed was that um, in one of the villages, these emissaries for, um, for these emissaries for Montezuma arrived and they like quickly took 20 or 30 men as prisoners and brought them back to Tenochtitlan and, and Cortez is like, what's going on? And they said, well, these are taxes that we have to pay, um, taxes in the form of our best young men. And they were being brought back for human ritual sacrifice. And when Cortez figured this out, he thought, well, maybe I can get these guys, maybe I can convince them that like we could change this paradigm a bit. We can change the narrative. And so he started to befriend some of the leaders and he said, look, I've got arms, I've got horses. I'll, if you give me men I'll, and start going with me, we'll go confront Montezuma. And Montezuma at that point, I mean, the empire he controlled had, it was like 80,000 square miles from Mexico City to Guatemala and um, something around 5 million people. Uh, and so not all of them were happy with the situation. And so Cortez begins to gather uh, indigenous troops and bring them over the mountains towards Tenochtitlan. And by the time, you know, he arrives, he's got significant numbers. Yeah, because it, it, it's there's some unbelievable early skirmishes where they're completely outmanned, but the cavalry advantage, especially on open territory, uh, just sends the opponent into complete disarray. I mean, there's times where you're writing about this and it feels like maybe there's 200 people on the Spanish side and there's thousands of Aztec warriors and yet they're just so disorganized and overwhelmed in an open setting from the cavalry advantage that you're just like, this is incredible that, that the Spanish can even pull this off and that Cortez is like figuring out all these things on the fly, which I also love the kind of the underlying, um, I don't know, it's not, not a theme necessarily, but it's just something to be aware of, of like the advances in technology when you're faced with a superior opponent and how quickly the Aztecs inside, um, Tenochtitlan and how quickly they're advancing because of, of all the things that they're realizing that they're up against. So like there's there's something to be said of that. And that, that's happened. It's not specific to Mexico. It's happened all over the world, uh, the course of history. But when you talk about his pursuit of like gold versus spreading the, the word of his God, um, whenever I read back and think of like, I remember Paul Thoreau and the Happy Isles of Oceanic would just talk about like the different places that were settled by like American missionaries and how... Yeah how their culture was just altered like irreparably so and the places that are still more traditional to their cultures are like always the places that you would enjoy seeing now a little bit more um you know look it could be debated a couple different spots here but when cortez is faced with like his pursuit of gold his pursuit of conquering to to make something of himself i i have to imagine the human sacrificing part of it <laughs> <laughs> wanting to end that but was was actually earnest because it, it is a con like i can't stand reading about when they show up to be like let's take down your idols and let's put up my idols and, and everybody's like what is this cross like we're putting this up right. but when they're talking about stealing <laughs> when montezuma's men are stealing children to sacrifice them and rip out their hearts because their belief is that their god needs a human sacrifice for the sun to come up every day. And whoever was the first guy to try to figure out, hey, you think if we just start sacrificing our own, the sun will come up every day and like how long that lasted, which is its own study. I, right. I, I, yeah. I just imagine that in, 
Cortez and his people had to have been horrified because it's such, it's not just a graphic event. It's so graphic in these areas where these sacrifices take place in the collection of of limbs and skulls and the blood <laughs> everywhere. It had to be horrifying to anybody not of that world. Right. I mean, and they're witnessing some of this. So yeah, you've got, um, I think it's a, it's a clash not only of, of culture and empire. And, and I always look at this as kind of like um, Cortez is an alien arriving at a place, you know, and these two people have never seen each other, um, had no knowledge that the other even existed. It's one of the most amazing meetings in human history. This is, this is you know, obviously when, when Cortez gets to Montezuma. But you're right, before then, Cortez has witnessed human ritual sacrifice. He, uh, I believe he was, he was truly devout, for sure. But he was certainly also using his devotion and uh, his religious fervor and zeal as a kind of ongoing justification for what he's doing, because he, he's killing people too, you know? And so there's carnage on both sides. Um, but yeah, when Cortez sees all of this, he realizes, um, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm willing to help these people put a, a stop to it. And, and so let's see how many of these, um, members I can get on my side. Okay. So while he's gaining all these allies that are upset with Montezuma and like, it's just the way of the world. It's the way it works. Hey, here's the epicenter. Yeah. Here's the person that's in charge. And here's these satellite posts everywhere. And it's like, man, if you can actually run this guy out, that improves my situation. I think there was also a lot of confusion to be like, okay, now you're just part of Spain. It's like, all right, where do I sign? Like, I don't care. Maybe they were <laughs> horrified by the horses and cannons, but he's still communicating with Montezuma through these runners suggesting to Montezuma that he has all this like respect for him and grace and we just want to understand your world. So they finally, like after months and months of don't show up, don't show up, don't show up, Montezuma uh, receives Cortez and his army. Um, and it's one of the oddest relationships. So really go wherever you want over this first time that they visit. Yeah, it, it's really amazing because Montezuma allows Cortez to enter the city. And, you know, by the way, this place is remarkable. It's uh, 200,000 people plus. It's bigger than any city in Europe at the time. And the men and Cortez are blown away by what they see. There's this resplendent city built on a lake with these giant causeways or bridges protecting it that you have to ride or, or move through to get to the city. It's very well guarded. And when Montezuma allows him to come in. I mean, he's being followed by all of these attendants who who won't aren't allowed to look Montezuma in the eye, or they're dead. Um, and so Montezuma invites him and the Spaniards into the city as guests. Now, there's speculation that he really is trying. He's not afraid of them because he's got numbers, but that he really wants to learn. He's inquisitive. He wants to learn about them, and he probably feels like he could kill them at any time. But like they're a novelty to him. He's he wants to understand who these people are, where they come from, and who their leader is. And so Cortez is invited in. He gets to stay in Montezuma's uh, elaborate palaces. Um, they're hosted, feted, wined, and dined. Uh, and the weirdest part to me is that I mean Cortez is t eventually flips the the script on him and he's kind of like well you're a prisoner but you can move around with my guards um and montezuma begins to take him out on um on the the big lake um at tenochtitlan at tenochtitlan in his boats and cortez gets to see the entire layout the whole um, many miles of the perimeter, and this is going to come in handy later because he's going to he starts to understand exactly how this place is set up. I mean, it's got aqueducts, irrigation, uh, floating farms. Uh, there are marketplaces, the ball game, you know, where you play to the death. Um, and and Montezuma's like they're they're sort of weird bros for months, and um, <laughs> it's very strange. And, and, you know, I think they're, they're both on kind of fact-finding missions, like trying to figure out who each other are, um, who's got power and control, and uh, it literally goes on for months, and which has some, also has some repercussions because a lot of the, the lower-ass tech nobility uh, and the people are wondering, like, what, why is he hosting these, these interlopers who have been killing people along the way, you know? 
Um, and so there's a little bit of dissension among the Aztec populace, too, where they're like, we don't really uh, think that Mon- Montezuma is handling this correctly. Well, exactly. Um, there's a lot of different stuff that we get into, but I, I want to really focus on like the final, the last two battles, because um, Montezuma then, oh. as you said, the, the script flips. It's, it's almost like dueling arrogance where Cortez's superiority is easier to see and understand, but yet Montezuma is like, whatever, fine, like come survey the whole thing. Because then once Cortez is on another mission, um, somebody underneath Cortez ends up leading to this bloody massacre right in the center of town. Um, Cortez has to come back and they, they basically have to like now fight for real, even though if it feels like it's incredibly disorganized and they're too like far in the interior, this is not like Cortez's plan. Like, you know, deep down, he's always thinking of taking this place over, even if he respects right. it. He, he had, he has, he tries to be like mutually respectful of Montezuma because of his position, but ultimately he doesn't really respect him or his people. And they're still so turned off by the human sacrifice that there's, there's no way of avoiding the superiority complex that Cortez would have. But when they get ousted, it, there's there's a real like delicate moment there where it feels like, okay, the Aztecs probably feel great because they overwhelmed Cortez in this group and they barely escaped with their lives. And now because of the surrounding areas, they're playing favorites the entire time, which happens again in the last battle where there's there's all these allies that can turn on you quickly with their 80,000 person army and say, you know what, actually, we're back with Montezuma. So take us through like the Montezuma part of it the first battle, the change of power and Tenochtitlan, and then Cortez trying to figure out a way to actually do what feels like at that stage of the story, impossible. Yeah. So that's really amazing. Um, in, in fact, the, uh, the dissension becomes so becomes essentially a riot. And, uh, at some point Cortez and his men have to, uh, Cortez is gone for a while, but his, his men bring out Montezuma, uh, onto this big, um, terrorist to show that he's still in charge and people are hurling rocks and spears and um at the spaniards but all but montezuma actually gets struck and it looks it, you know it, it seems like he either gets hit by a rock or a spear and he gets killed at which point the aztecs are like well okay the spaniards are out of here now and so the the night you reference is is called the la noche triste the sorrowful night and the spaniards have to get out of there now they've got all this gold right so they have also <laughs> found this room full of gold like from the floor to the ceiling literally and they've been pilfering that for a while. And so once the uh, they realize that we're outnumbered, the Spaniards realize we're outnumbered, we've got to get out of here, they, they take off over these causeways. They're being shot at by uh, men in these canoes. I mean, it's just a, it's carnage. And uh, many, many Spaniards die, but they, they manage to escape. And Cortez ends up getting like struck in the head and falls off his horse, goes into a coma, but like comes back and... What's remarkable is that Cortez has decided that the only way to get into this place, uh, and this is the most innovative military thing I, I've ever read about in history, um, what, over the other side of the mountains, after escape, he he has this ship builder he, he, well, By the way, he, he, after, like, it's after escape, he, you mentioned the coma. So at that point, yeah. you're like, okay. I mean, everybody is hurt. They're losing horses. They have new, no numbers. They have no supplies. They, they have almost... Nothing. And yet Cortez decides, and I would agree with you, I need to build a Navy. Right, right. right. And so he he has this uh, shipbuilder guy, Martin Lopez, um, on this lake. And then he, he enlists all these Tlaxcalan warriors and bearers, at like 50,000 of them, right? This other tribe. And he ends up building 13 ships, the brigantines they're called, building them on at this makeshift uh, harbor kind of place taking them apart, carrying them with all of these men back over the mountains, which are high, by the way, there are some of them are high as, as, as 12,000 feet. Um, and then setting up this, uh, uh, they, they dig canals like two to three miles from the main lake, reconstruct the ships. And then at, when the time is right, they launch this armada of 13 ships and arrive in a total surprise on the city of Tenochtitlan and begin just, you know, firing cannons and sending off boats. And the surprise attack 
uh, is r- remarkably effective. And Cortez is able to like retake the city. Montezuma is now dead. His brothers and other uh, other lower leaders are, are fighting for power and position. And, and Cortez has taken over the city. Now, he isn't able to completely take it over. Uh, in fact, it becomes called the siege. Uh, it, it lasts about three months, right? Because he's able to like get on the perimeter and then there's still, uh, you know, there's still resistance, right? And so for, for months on end, Cortez, um, maintains, you know, small assaults, um, and starts to cut off the aqueducts. He's gonna he's gonna cut the water off from the city, right? Um, this becomes like a really really dark chapter in history, though, because the other thing that has happened is that um, inadvertently, uh, Cortez's men, the Spaniards, have have infected the populace with smallpox, and so now these the Aztec people begin dying in just droves and droves and droves. It's a sickening scene. Uh, and Cortez realizes this, that, that, that the resistance starts to diminish. And so over about a three month period, he, he waits them out. And eventually, you know, tragically uh, for, for the Aztecs, um, uh, you know, Cortez comes in, raises the city to the ground, burns it, uh, which is, which, is so ironic because he himself in letters to uh, the king has said it's the most remarkable and beautiful place I've ever seen. Yet for power, I'm going to raise it to the ground and burn it and build and, and then build churches and, and colonial buildings on top of that. There's no denying his, um, his just the awe that he had for the city um, because you have like his his words in your book. Um, and it's just like, look, there's no way, there's no way that they can do it without it. Um, because they weren't making any progress. But if you think about Cortez, the politician, the military leader, the, the number of things that he's thinking about, I mean, from the moment he stepped foot on Veracruz, it's very clear that he was determined to be his own person and and take any risk necessary, but he's also dealing with people that are aligned with leadership in Cuba. And then there's all these other people hearing about this because this treasure ship is sent back to the king of Spain. And then that makes the rounds. And so now he's got people that are his countrymen showing up to Veracruz that are actually supposed to take over for him. He's right. trying to balance all of these, yeah. these different villages that are either with him or against him while he's trying to. Uh, I mean, look, he's a despicable person in, in the history, of, but there's certainly elements of him being like how could anyone of any uh, like how could anyone have ever balanced all of these things working against him over this this three-year period and still be successful it's yeah you know what was amazing to me about him too is that he he understood right i'm glad you mentioned that the the gold that that, so they've been sending back gold the 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 crown gets a fifth of the gold right the royal fifth and then if you keep the crown happy you know you can begin to set up governorships and take over lands and and now you're going to be immensely wealthy cortez understood how long it took information to get from one place to another so he was always like i'm going to do this and by the time the crown hears about it it's going to be five months later right so then by the time he gets a response, he figures if I've already taken over the city and now Spain owns it, what are they going to do? You know, um, there may be some uh, some squabbling among other people who are fighting for spoils, other governors. Uh, but Cortez is always ahead of the game, right? He's uh, he's always just um, figuring out how to how to beat the system, and you know he ends up. Uh, being appointed the governor of New Spain or the, you know, captain general, governor of New Spain. I mean, he gets one of the highest posts. And with that comes like Mexico, you know, I mean, yeah, he's basically in charge of Mexico, right? (laughs) Right. I mean, like, and so, you know, he's, he's willing to have um, these, uh, the crown a little bit disgruntled with him uh, for what he knows he's going to be eventually able to um, manipulate and smooth over. Which he does. Well, anybody that does the kind of work that you did on this, and it's just a, it's a, it's an easy read. I know there's probably some stuff that we've said here and be like, you had fun reading all this, but I did. It just was, it was a lot of fun to read. It it went really fast. I know you've done a ton of stuff. Um, How does this compare maybe to like the stuff that you're the most proud of that you've done in your life, buddy? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, Yeah, this 
this probably took the most research uh, of any book that I've written um, because I didn't know anything about it before I started. Uh, you know, I bit off a pretty big book to begin with here. It was like I had written a book about Davy Crockett. Uh, and then I, I wrote this, you know, wrote this book and I'm like, oh, I'll just start with like the conquest of Mexico and the and the changing uh, forces of the new world. That's a small theme. Um, but yeah, I've been... I'm kind of a chameleon. I've written about everything from um, the first Europeans to descend the entire length of the Amazon to I'm, I've just finished a three book uh, Arctic exploration and expedition kick. So I've been on the ice for the last uh, five or six years in my brain and physically, too. I've gone to Svalbard and uh, the, I just my newest book is about the first people to try to fly blimps to the North Pole in 1907. Uh, you know, just like crazy stuff. I, I really like um, humans at the very edges of survival and um, what they can bear, you know. Uh, and so it's been a fun ride. You know, I've, I'm kind of all over the map uh, with with the subject matter. But usually it does involve adventure, expedition and and a good deal of uh, of carnage and survival. By the way, my son, who is a major fan, uh, shout out. Gooch Valley Gliz Gobblers, Boise City League champions. Um, uh oh. In, in hoops. Okay. <laughs> um, for Ryan, if you were made commissioner of a new nationwide initiative to retool the youth through collegiate sports ecosystem, what would your approaches and focus be? Oh my God. God I wasn't Hunter. ready for this. Does it have to be specific to collegiate or does it have to be? I, look, I think the, the best chance we have. Um, I think we're really protective of young people that we'll have no relationship with. Um, mm-hmm. I've always thought this where like when somebody who's young fails, we'll say, well, they failed because they were young. And it's like, well, what about the, the middle aged guy that failed? Like, you know, the old guy <laughs> yeah. fails, the young guy fails, but the middle aged guy fails, but he does, we don't get to put a label on him. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that it's, it's fixing collegiate sports, but I think we're heading towards a time where we just need to accept that there are certain people that look at us at, as athletics as their profession um, and stop pretending that everybody needs to be well-rounded to make people that don't know the other person feel better. That, that's so, a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that means that by the time they get to college, that they're more prepared to just like what, uh, look, you're a professor. <clears throat> um, school was very important to me because I wasn't good enough at, at other stuff, but I don't know, man. I, I think sometimes some of this stuff can be like really outdated. It'd be great if everybody looked at it as this off, awesome opportunity and this great learning experience. But I think like the the special, the special, like I think they do this internationally with soccer. They do it internationally with basketball. Uh, they, they seem to do it a lot of other places mm-hmm. in here where we're, we're still trying to serve like two different things um, with, with the approach. And like, look, nobody's going to tell me that they, you're I can't tell anyone that they're wrong. It's like, hey, you better have a backup plan, get your degree, make the contacts and all this kind of stuff. Like in theory, that's a that should be a good thing. That should be something that everybody wants. But I think sometimes we we get a little, I don't know, we get a little outdated with the approach when it comes yeah, to sports. I appreciate that. Uh, last last collegiate note. Um, I've been at Washington State long enough to have had uh, the following uh, Wazoo s- students. Um, Drew Bledsoe. <laughs> Good student. Uh, good, 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 Drew Bledsoe, good student. Uh, in one class, I had um, River Craycraft and Luke Falk in the same class. Uh, both good nice. students. Yeah. Craycraft. And, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Craycraft's still out there doing it, man. Um, getting reps, you know. Um, Love but it. But the, the, the only funny story I have about Drew is that at one point, he uh, he was uh, – he, he'd done this quarterback sneak against Cal, right? And I didn't really know him yet. And he did this quarterback sneak. He go, it was like on first down or something. He goes like 30 yards and trips and falls on the one-yard line and fumbles into the end zone and Cal gets the ball. So I, I had graded these papers over the weekend, you know, back in the day when you, you wrote red pen on white paper. And I came into the class late and I knew he was in there. And I walked in with all the papers and I intentionally just – tripped and fell on the ground and, and dropped all the papers and said, Oh, I fumbled and Bledsoe just stood up. And at that point I was like, Oh my God, this guy's huge. Um, and he was, I mean, he took, he was very good spirited about it. He laughed. And, uh, I was like, you know, whatever. 
But I had Gleason too. I had Steve Gleason, a great honor to have him as a student. No kidding. Yeah. And another tiny sidebar on Gleason. He, um, uh, it was a, it was a spring semester class and he walked up at the end of a class and I, he said, um, Hey professor, I was wondering if I'm going to be gone a lot because I'm playing both baseball and spring football practice this, this uh, spring. And I'm like, wow, football. And I, so I'm standing there next to him and the guy wasn't very big, you know? And I go, well, what, what position do you play? And he's like, I'm, I'm an outside linebacker, you know? And I, and I go, come on. And I played rugby. I was pretty scrappy at that point. And he just smiled and he, he rolls up his sleeve and there's this freaking major gun, right? And, and he's like, and also I'm kind of fast. And so I spent the next season watching that guy run from sideline to sideline, make like every tackle on the field. I think he may have led the Pac-12 in tackles that, that season. And I was like, I never, I never doubted anyone again after that. Uh, any Robbie Calgill experiences? I no, I watched Robbie Calgill a ton, um, but uh, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have him as a student. All right, because I'll just tell you, I <laughs> loved that Washington State basketball team. Oh my I god, loved that team. So you work with Mike Leach, who I've interviewed in the past uh, numerous times. Everybody misses him, Geronimo. I think at one interview we were asking about his offense and he just ended up on Geronimo. Like this is before you had even done the book with him. Um, is this, was the connection as a professor of, at Washington state? Is that how that happened? Yeah. When I learned that, uh, uh, that when I learned that Mike Leach was coming to Washington state, I, uh, I had understood that my agent, Scott Waxman had done swing your sword. He sold that book. So um, I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with Native American history too. So I just went to his office, right? I've been teaching there for 35 years. Um, I went to his office and I, I brought a few books and I said, Hey, you know, um, we share the same agent. Um, I, you know, I, I know you're interested in Geronimo. Uh, would you read a little bit of what I do and see if we might be able to collaborate? Right. And I mean, he, he was really quick to come back and go, I loved Crockett book. Uh, let's do it. You know, and he just sent me, uh, it turned me loose on the history part. And then he wanted to do the leadership lessons aspect of it. Um, the most amazing part was really just hanging with Leach and spending a year and a half or so um, in this process, because like I would write history and then give him the chapters. Right. And then he, it turns out he's a nocturnal, he was a nocturnal dude. So I'd get a call at like 1130 PM. I'm in bed and Leach would be like, let's go over chapter three word by word. You know, and I'm like, what, what? I got to teach tomorrow, man. And he, he, so he would like go through the chapter and I'm like, Mark, and he's like, I don't like the way that sounds. Uh, I don't like the way that sounds. Also, how do these guys get their, how do they make moccasins while they're running from the cavalry? You know, and where do they get water? And he was just like, he's so inquisitive and expansive in his thinking. Um, and the other part that was, I mean, I got to become friends with him and get to know him really well. And the other part was like, we would go over to this cafe Moro in downtown Pullman and, and you could never go anywhere with coach Leach, uh, it, because he just talked to everyone. Right. So I got like a time frame here of a couple hours to really work on something and we're in there and he's talking to the baristas. He's talking to these other folks, you know, and I'm sitting there going, Mike, we got to kind of get on this. Right. And he's like, oh, you know, whatever, I'll call you later tonight. <laughs> and it was just like, uh, yeah, it was amazing. I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not a regret-based guy, but I will say um, the only regret I have is that he asked me three different times to come hang with him in Key West. And for one reason or another, things didn't, didn't work out. And um, he would always, you know, so I, I, I regret that. Um, and he was also really interested in, in like uh, cons conspiracy theory and stuff. So he would, uh, he would text me and I, I was on this TV show for a while and we did a couple episodes, including uh, a, one on historical mysteries and including one on DB Cooper. And he, he'd be like texting me about DB Cooper. What do, is there anything new? And one of the last texts I have from him, he was like, um, have you heard about that place in Southern Chile? That's kind of like uh, Southern Chile's area 51. We should try to go there. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. Um, but what a great, what a great experience. Uh, hilarious and and brilliant man um the other thing that was absolutely remarkable is that in the couple of years i spent with him uh working on this book I, I don't think we ever talked about football 
He, he always yeah. wanted to talk about history. You know, he always wanted to talk about, I mean, he would apply it to football and he would apply football to history. Um, and, and, but he never, you know, I think the only thing I ever said was that he should probably, we both played rugby. He was at BYU. I played at Idaho. And, uh, he said, I said, you should probably get a, you know, either an Aussie rules or a rugby punter. That'd be good. And he's like, well, it doesn't matter. I don't punt. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's true. Hey, man, everybody that got to know him really liked him. Um, so yeah, Empire of Isis Stone that came out a couple years ago. So I can't wait to check that out. But for those that want more, there's a lot that we didn't get to, obviously, in this conversation. Uh, it moves really quick, Conquistador. Thanks to Buddy Levy, man, for your time. Hey, Ryan, I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, it's been a great pleasure. I love your show, I love what you do. You want details? Bye. I drive a Ferrari 355 Cabriolet. What's up? I have a ridiculous house in the South Fork. I have every toy you can possibly imagine. And best of all, kids, I am liquid. So, now you know what's possible. Let me tell you what's required. Life advice, email address, lifeadvicerr at gmail.com. Okay, let's go with a common theme, but a new attack on a young man's dilemma. 22 going on 23, 62 listed at six, four in a high school basketball roster. I like where this kid's head is wow. at already. 175. I think I may do my next license. Six, seven, two forty nine. See, <laughs> see what happens. See if anybody says anything. Although it's kind of a lie. I don't like living as a lie, so maybe I won't do it, but that would have done it in my twenties. I graduated last May and I'm in a somewhat of a personal dilemma. Before I explain, let me preface by saying, I don't think I have it all figured out. We agree. Good on you. I know I'm only 22. I know that nobody's first job is their dream job. I am grateful to have my job. Lastly, things could be a hell of a lot worse. Lifelong Timberwolves, uh, Timberwolves fan. I lived through 14, 15 season. All right. I graduated with a business major and an English minor. Hey, man, shout out to the English miners. Learn how to tell stories. Organize your thoughts. Passion for literature. A month after graduating, I landed myself a job that pays relatively well for my age and in a field I have some family history. The problem is I have absolutely zero passion for this field. Welcome to life. For most of us. My role is in marketing specifically, and the upside is that I'm learning new and useful hard skills that I can take with me in the future. I just know that this field is something I don't want to be in long term. The crowd groans. I'm too young and too new to this job role to know, A, if I could end up being good at it, B, if I would enjoy, could benefit from using these skills but I'm uh, that I'm learning, but in a field I'm actually passionate about. I am very interested in other fields, but these other fields tend to either pay less, require more schooling, or be difficult to enter health wellness, nutrition, well, you can get to health and wellness with an Instagram account, but nutrition, travel agency, teaching, history, literary arts. My dilemma poses a few questions. Do I continue to work in a field that I have zero passion for when I could be using my valuable, flexible younger years to get started towards my desired areas of interest? Or is it too early to even be worrying about it? This feels like an age old question. I'm stuck between feeling ungrateful and wanting more. I'm work I, I worked landscape past tense Shout construction out. seven days a week in the summers growing up i used to say i'd never complain if i was in an air-conditioned office i think of myself as a realist is this just me being idealistic i sometimes wonder if a magic genie granted each of us humans all of our wishes would we still find create something for ourselves to desire yes something to nitpick Yes, I'm answering these on the fly because I've always felt that. I don't care who you are and what job you have. Like they may publicly share, like bitching. just yeah, like we like bitching about stuff, man. Constant push for growth and wanting more is what made us successfully evolve. But can it also be a curse? The Rolling Stones said, "You can't always get what you want, but sometimes you might just find you get what you need." I think this guy. Do should I go sound back to like school? <laughs> it yeah. sounds like he needs to go back to school. Do I sound like I need to be prescribed a sedative? Should I just go off the grid and live off the land in remote mm. South America? There's a bachelor party we could link you up with. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's um, probably over by now, but uh, yeah. You guys are the best wolves back. Hey, man, you're not alone. But I always think it's good. I think it's good when you're asking these questions. Uh, you're too young to be this worried about all of this stuff all at the same time. But it means that you're smart enough. Uh, and you wrote a great email. You touched on a million different things, but like, welcome to the party, man. This is what happens. And this is why college is the toughest. I think it's one of the toughest adjustments because all of college is you think it's real and it's not. It's fucking fake. It's fantasy land. There's a reason why there's guys in their 40s still fucking miss it. Okay. And 
then you go into this with this massive wake up call of of these moments where you thought you were ready for them, but you're just not. I think the biggest thing, if I had to like just do a couple sentences on my own personal journey of discovery, all right, it's that when you're younger, you seem to believe that there's going to be this end line, like beating the final boss of, of just pure raging happiness, all right? And you're going to get, if things work out and you put in the work, you get the right breaks and all those different things, you're going to build towards this moment of like elation. And the biggest trick is that really all the awesome, like happy, carefree stuff or has already happened, man. Just happened. Now I it just, happened. yeah. <laughs> now I do think that that version of happy can be replaced by the happiness and pride that you feel in having children. And I do think that that's the newer version. Not, I shouldn't say newer version, but I think people understand what I'm trying to say is that whatever elation you felt then is like an entirely different, super intense, your ability to love something in a way that you've never, ever felt before. And it becomes this priority because now you're tasked with this mess of responsibility. Uh, that's why I think having children is actually really great for a lot of people. Okay. But if you're just talking, and I don't mean it selfishly, but if you're just talking about your own path of what it is, is that I felt like it's like, Hey, the big joke is that there's always something else that's going to be a challenge. There isn't a final boss in life. It's just a new boss or a new, and I'm not talking about like your workplace boss, but hopefully you're actually driven enough to continue to have more challenges. I mean, some people would look at it and be like, I want to just get, get to a place where it's just smooth sailing, where there are no hassles and I'm going to avoid all hassles by never wanting to grow and you know, look, some people grow enough to where they have no hassles because they're just so important everything they're doing. So I'm, I'm kind of going in a bunch of different directions at the same time. But I can only, look, I, I'm generalizing a bit here, but I'm also thinking about my friends, the way we talked about our lives and what we were going to be like as adults in our early 20s. And you're just, you're just, you're, it's not to say like, hey, life actually sucks and it's really hard. I think you start to just accept that there isn't this, perfectly smooth obtainable passage through the rest of your life maybe for the rare exceptions but we don't argue exceptions on this podcast but everybody kind of is feeling the same way that you are but you're now feeling it for the first time and as far as like should i get it in and out of this field when you what graduated a couple months ago i'd give it a little bit more time you may learn things about how you're interacting with people you may learn more about your priorities all this stuff like nobody actually really likes those entry level jobs. Very few people are you going to meet and be like, it's fucking awesome. Everybody's in charge of me. I don't know anything I'm doing. Older guys are super pissed just because I'm young. I fuck up all the time. I make no money and my dress shirts aren't nearly as cool as the other people. Okay. Like <laughs> nobody's going, this is the best. And I mean, again, some, people, yeah. <laughs> some people get really lucky with those entry level deals or Somebody knows a person and then they get hooked up with, maybe you're in a field and you get really lucky early on. Maybe you're in a field that you're super passionate about, but I wouldn't worry about, you, you sound like you feel like you want all this figured out by September. And I'm just telling you, that's not going to happen. You're going to learn things about yourself that you don't even realize you're learning. It's essentially saying like, you are now in a class that you don't, you didn't even realize you registered for. And once we get to six months, a year from now, then you're going to be like, oh, okay, this is actually what all of this stuff was about. Yeah, I mean, not, I'm, I'm not even going to go down the whole thing where you ask like a bunch of successful people, their starting point or like fresh out of college has like nothing to do with whatever they're doing now. I mean, everyone will tell you this. I mean, but the other thing is, is like, it sounds like he's bit, what do you say, business and English? That's, that's his two things. Business, if it, if it is business, it's sort of like, sort of like, like uh, communications or something. It's like, you're not really sure. It's not specific, like computer science or you know certain like narrow down things it's sort of like well that sounds like a good idea so i mean it also like i wouldn't actually take out going back to school like somebody's got to have a fucking master's degree out there and if you feel like maybe that's your thing and it unlocks some some different sort of jobs like you're you're in the part where it's the it's never going to be easier to do that than like this time so um i wouldn't i wouldn't throw that away and i think the further you get away from having like deadlines and textbooks and shit the harder it is to jump back in um 
But like, if you really think like, well, maybe I can add something to this that'll make me be able to teach what I want to do or, or whatever the fuck it is. Maybe I want to teach English or, or like you said, if it's whatever it is with more schooling, I don't think there's a better time than doing it now, especially if you got a little taste of this and you're like, don't look at through the lens where you are now. Look at fucking Bill in the corner office. And you're like, do I even want that? So um, if you're thinking you just want to switch it up, I think I think the the going back to school thing is probably the it's probably the time to do it now. And the longer you don't just really think about if that's if there's like some other shit you want to unlock or if it's like there's something on this plane that you exist on now that's kind of attainable for you. Yeah. I, I don't have much to add on this. I think you guys said everything I would say. I do find it kind of interesting, though, that and like a lot of people have written about this and talked about it, like how like happiness, I feel like now is t so tied to what your job is, whereas like our parents, even going back however long you want. Happiness like, starts at six o'clock. I, I feel like people. <laughs> I feel like people could find happiness in other things. They like, hey, I go to my job and I do my job. Is, is it my favorite thing in the world? No, but then I have all these other things that I do that make my life full and complete and make me happy as a person. And I, I'm not saying it's wrong. I just, I, it's just very interesting how because I've, I've thought about this like in like 10, 15 years, is everyone just gonna? I mean, you could say this about right now, but is everyone just gonna want to be an Instagram influencer or a TikTok inf influencer or whatever social media thing there is? Because like, that seems like a cool job. But then I also see that like very little few people even make money doing that ever. But it seems like so many people are, are putting in all this effort to like be famous or be an influencer. And like, no one's actually even making that much money per person. And it's like, are people going to shift back to just like doing normal jobs or wanting or, or like, or is being a plumber, for example, my dad grew up, you know, plumbing, heating and air conditioning. Is that going to have like a swing back to like, hey, there's just gonna be a ton of guys that are plumbers and then have these awesome things on the side that they do or they, as you said, Ryan, have families. So like, I don't know, I'm not saying you're wrong to just say, hey, my career is defined by how what my happiness level is in life. But is, are there other things that you can also do? Like if you're successful and you said you're successful in whatever this early um, entry level job was, and maybe it can set you up for a very, you know, at least rich life as far as money and wealth. Are there other things in your life that you can find happiness in? I, I, I don't have the answers to these things. I just kind of find these discussions interesting. Yeah. Do you have a buddy taking a chance on like a start on a startup business or something? I don't know if you got some time for that. Keep your options open. His bicep curls are 32 and a half pounds. Okay. I didn't want to say one way or Wrong. the other. Wrong email. Wrong email. That's the next one we're going to read. Okay. Uh, I, I would start here. Okay. You're asking for answers that you're just not going to have. So you can drive yourself crazy for all these different answers right now. But I think the positive, as I say to anybody with this kind of mindset early on, your awareness and wondering and asking these questions is a, is a massive positive that you want to take stock of where you're at, what it means for your own runway. And all these things. But what you can't do is you can't do a personal update every single day of your life or you're going to drive yourself fucking crazy. All right? Fair. Let the day exist. All right. Back to curl guy. Yeah. Your happiness should not be a daily stock price. Like, how are you feeling? Uh, 12 minutes ago, I was pretty down. Uh, and again, I don't think that guy was, by the way, when he said like the whole idea of him being outside, all he thought of is if I could ever be in a corner or not even say corner office, that was Kyle's reference. If I could be in an office with, with, uh, AC. office with AC, I'd, I'd never complain about anything. I would be looking outside going like, I'd rather have the break. I think about that every once in a while. The freedom. Yeah. 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 Give me the break. Give me the dump truck, dude. Let's fucking go. Where are we headed? I yeah. thought about many dump times runs. if I could be a, like an 18 wheeler driver. Cause I, I don't mind being alone. I like listen, you know, I don't I don't mind driving. I like listening to podcasts. I feel like I could be able to entertain myself. I thought about that, but I don't I don't know. I play maybe a regional high school, one. It's tougher than people just, think. Just up and down 95, like maybe a regional one. Yeah, like one where you come home whole... every day. Yeah. 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 Come home every day. You're already counting the shots. You haven't even started yet. Well, no, there's all the on the on the on the trucks, they say like 95% of our drivers come home every day. And I'm like, oh, that's not that bad. You know? <laughs> Wait, so when that. you're on the that's highway. <laughs> <laughs> wait is that in like home to the hotel or like survive what are we i don't know just let's come home every day so i'm like oh, all right so you know what if you bad. show up to the office and go hi i'm here for the job i want to be in the five percent <laughs> yeah. road dog i don't want to come home yeah. <laughs> how do i never show up with a home? toothpick kyle i was thinking about you with a toothpick the other day could we get that out of you for a summer 
I think a toothpick. Oh, when a toothpick I tried to changes quit, everything. Uh, you know what? They got these great cinnamon ones. They're like dipped in some sort of cinnamon shit. Um, helped a couple of buddies quit. I tried it. I still needed cigarettes, but um, well, at least my brain told me I needed cigarettes. But um, yeah, I, I imagine like this is drinking. If you like drink, you're gonna smoke. Also, a great point. But you know, no speed- one's ever had six beers and be like, you know what I could do? I could go for a piece of wooden cinnamon right now. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Reminds me of the old Big Red. Um, anyway. Okay. Uh, we got another one here. That was the bicep curl yep. deal. Because I don't think we we didn't read this one about. Whenever we have a female woman listener, we Good usually we remember these. Yeah. So. Uh, I love the all right. Now the female woman thing, too, by the way. It just that's just the way it is now. Dude, you're just our tagging bases. me on stuff when somebody's calling people females, and I'm like, I really don't want to be in this fight. But <laughs> I actually guys catch the rule was, yeah, <laughs> you, you I, got I, it backwards. <laughs> I think I do. Okay, guy, I'm interested in looks like a '70s porn star, and I want him to cut his hair. Right, we have not read this. We would remember this. Never heard right? that one. Nope, never. Yeah, heard this. stats: yeah. five eight, one thirty five, bench one thirty five, bicep curl thirty two and a half. We gave that guy credit for. It. That's a great bicep curl. Um, if we're talking about dumbbells, but, um, 32 and a half combined, I think it's, I think she's probably, well, 32 and a half though. That's probably the full deal. Then that's still really good though. Anyway, player comp 2020 playoffs, Duncan Robinson, but because I can get hot from three when I need to, but otherwise my basketball skill set is just, uh, generally just above average, incredible off the ball cutting. So I hope you have that in your game too. If you're going to be talking about Duncan. Ryan, Srudy, Kyle, I need your words of wisdom. Sorry, this is a bit long. Mid to late 20s woman who's currently single. I've been nice. off and on with a guy I've been friends with for about 10 years. So they met when they were teenagers. The initial time we started seeing each other was about five years ago. So let's say 20. I know on and off generally means there's an incompatibility there. But in our case, it's basically been because of timing, being with other people, various times, et cetera. I moved across the country after college a few months after we'd started seeing each other. So we ended things not wanting to do long distance for who knows how long. However, I moved back home a year later after not liking where I was living. Needless to say, the guy, also mid-late 20s. Sorry, this is a bit. Well, wait a minute. I uh, started hanging out again. Um, let's call him Tim. I get the. F- I know a Tim. I get the feeling he wants to explore something serious with me. We've never been in a straight-up relationship with each other, given that we are now both living in the same area, both single, etc. However, all caps. There is one problem. Throughout most of our friendship, he was clean cut with short hair, which I love, as it looked good on him. But Tim recently wanted to embrace the long hair, like below the shoulders, long, and mustache look. He's had it for about a year now. I am very not attracted to guys with long hair like this. That is a really perfectly worded. Yep. Like, I am very not attracted to guys with long hair like this, but we have a connection that I truly believe in. It looks so bad to the point that he looks like a 70s porn star. So, like, a bad one? Or, all right. <laughs> That's could be left for debate as well. Some of those guys look great. Incredible abs. You want to talk about Jill and all? I understand that I have no say in his hair, especially because we aren't together. However, this is really hindering my ability to have the same level of physical attraction to him as I did before. I know that generally, it's a deep breath, if hair is a, uh, I know that generally, if hair is a make or break issue with someone, then it becomes, uh, then it means the feelings must not be that deep. However, it looks like an entirely different person with this look. And at the end of the day, physical attraction matters. He has a good heart. I truly believe we can be compatible for the long term as I've had feelings for him since we were teenagers. I think this is mutual. We have a connection I've truly never had with anyone else. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. So I want a relationship with him. I just really, I want a relationship with him. I just would really want him to go back to the old short hair look. How would you approach this? Um, It's going to come down to the simple math of humans. Are you hotter than he is? (laughs) Or is he hotter than you are? Now these weird... Let's let it get let's let it get gross phases that guys are going through, ladies. I feel you. I feel you, sister. It's fucking <sighs> annoying because a lot of dudes are just pushing the boundaries of what can I get away with that's still somewhat socially acceptable. Yeah. We didn't do this back then. The guys did not we got tightened up. Now I used to let me, you know, I know nobody wants to believe it, but when I had a full head of hair and I was a younger dude, I used to let it get a little rascally, but then it was that was always my move. These every 30 day motherfuckers looking like an extra Lego set. Like I would let myself 
not look great. And then when I came back in Thursday night, rye on the scene, I know. Yeah. Fresh I know. Haircut, Boys back. I, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, look out. Like if your max was you a seven, you tonight. Was, Whoa. Yeah. Well, guess what happens? Like it's still two points up from a five, <laughs> you know, it's like you were, you were walking around here like a five for a little while, bro. Now he's like a seven. Now men have just decided what can I get away with? I see dudes that I can tell are kind of cool. They've got the shorts. They've got the long John Elliott sweatshirt that's hanging a little lower. Mm -hmm. They've got the hat. Maybe there's a ring. There's always facial hair. The hair is shitty as can be. And they're always with like a nine, you know, especially when you're out here in California. You're just like, that guy's killing it. Like, yeah, that guy's killing it. That's the new look. That's the hot look. That's a great fit right there. But what's going on with his hair and all this stuff? Like, he looks like an asshole. So I feel for you, girls. I feel for you. Um, I, if you aren't hotter, mm, there is some good news here, though. There is some oh, good news you? here. They, she said it's been like 10 years of friendship and they were friends first. Like this, you might actually be able to get away with this. Not necessarily a joke, not necessarily, hey, we need to have a talk. But I think there's sort of a somewhere in between, like, you know, I just, the hair is really fucking this shit up for me, man. Like, there might be a way. I honestly totally. think peak hair on a dude is probably Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. Little stubble around the face, shoulder length. I think, I think that's peak. If you got to have long hair, just they'll be like, what do you think about this? And just show them, show them like, okay, Aragorn, like in the middle of a fucking battle. It's like, yeah, it's a little, it looks a little wet. Not sure if it is, but it's shoulder length, stubble. But that, definitely here's the problem. There. Here's the problem with that. And this goes off of what Ryan just said. The guys that do those looks, that pull those looks, because I'm in there. I'm in the trenches trying these things out. And some of them work and some of Are them don't Are you saying you're work. hot? No, because like I wanted to go for that Jon Snow kind of half bun up thing. And I looked like an idiot. I didn't. I don't think I looked very good. The problem I don't remember is, any buns with Jon Snow, buddy. I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. Last exactly. Samurai Saruti. It was, it was a look. <laughs> and I, I, I do miss my bun. I'd bring the bun back if I could. I just don't want to grow it out again. It's just a huge pain in the ass. But there are some guys like Legolas or, or like uh, like Aragorn, hey, who Legolas is great guys. as well, um, who like, OK, it's like one out of 100 guys can pull that look off and look hot. And that's to Ryan's know, point, like all these guys that it. do these weird things and have a weird look like, oh, you saw one actor do this and he was like made up and it was he had great lighting because it was probably a photo shoot. And you're like, oh, I could pull that off, too. I listen, I've been there. And that's what happens. Rifle King these of guys God, do these right. things, you're right. and they look bad. <laughs> like I'm testing out the mustache again right now. It might look terrible. I don't know. I'll look back at this I video and be like, great. "You're an idiot." But I just shaved it off. And I'm like, "Let's try it." Um, but so so anyway, to get back to the point, to ask this guy to just do that, you might not like that either. Like you might just want him like high and tight, cleanly shaven, and go from there. I think you're on to something though. You could probably just drop a like, "Hey, I'd marry you if you cut your hair," and just like as yes. an off yeah, line, that's you know, a way just to like do hanging it. out with friends. Not a joke. You know? A little bit of a sting to it. Yes. There's a way to mm -hmm. navigate that because you've been like through the through regular friendship together or just make little jokes. All just make jokes about the hair. Be like, oh, man, we got, you know, whatever Shaggy from Scooby Doo coming over here. You just make like bad jokes that, that she clearly knows that you don't like the hair, but that aren't going to like ruin your friendship or whatever future relationship you want to have. Put on Nat Geo prison abroad and then throw it on and be like, hey, we should watch this just so you can prepare for when you get busted. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also grass. take a picture of you together when you're teenagers, put it on the fridge, but I think there's a, a silver lining in all of this right now. You're banging an ugly guy. You're just not into it. <laughs> Are they banging? But I can predict just... your, oh, no, buddy, no, they're on. together. Did you read re between on, the lines dude. here? Rudy. All right, fine. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. Well, they said in between things. And, all right. My bad. Hmm. Hmm. Leave it alone. You're going to be dating one. this hot guy <laughs> soon. You're going to. This is this is temporary. Nobody sure. just goes into this and this is who I am now. This is a test. He's in his mid twenties. This is him just feeling himself a little bit. He saw some guy. Maybe it was. I don't know. He's getting coffee. Maybe he saw a guy recycling. Maybe at a volunteer center or something like that. He's like, maybe I could pull that off or whatever. Like Surdy has this mustache going on right now that looks like the guy who just had like an awesome supporting role in a new summer flick and then at the next public appearance people are like whoa because you know, that's what i think those guys do like really hot actors are like how bad can i actually look like go through your favorite actors looks and there's always some moment where like it got so easy for him he just like could i pull this off you know <laughs> could i just do this i mean jordan had a hitler mustache think about that mm. 
Like he just, he's like, I'm this back important. Yeah. What, what do no, you think I should uh, Google that's line. before? That's I a line from my... a comedian, by the way. Oh, okay. I'm about so to say, what should I Google? I don't know who it up? was. I don't want to change my whole right, like look ad up, uh, revenue. <laughs> I don't want to change the way they give me ads now. I just I want to be careful with this one. No. Look up. Uh, I'm trying to think. Chaplin? Um, should I go Chaplin ch- mustache? <laughs> no, 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 because that's kind of that's kind of. I don't want to start about. getting like small mustache, go, commando go, glasses, go Jude, ads on my. So Jude Law, ugly. See his hair fell apart. It's a mess. Sooner yeah. than oh, should have. I hate to say it. Is this for a role? Yeah. See, you don't know, do you? You don't know. Damn. I think Jude Law is um, like Eric Clapton. Every now and then would like totally change his look, but that felt more like designer. Anyway, here's the point: this has to be temporary. You could playfully hint at some things. Maybe you take the clean crop picture of you two together when you're teenagers. You put it on the fridge or whatever. I mean, Damn, obviously, that guy to point, you could just, yeah, yeah, you could just kind of say it. But I think the good news is all of this is really temporary. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be like you're dating an entirely new guy. So I see good things in your future. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, Zealous. guys, too, as they settle down, I mean, again, you, you, you had a long way to go, but they kind of get tend Less to maintenance. be the more conservative route. Yeah. they The, the hair kind of gets cut. Like, that's how I've been for the most part. Like, I just wouldn't grow my hair. Like, I tried a lot more things when I was. She could shave her head. I do now. She could do that. She go Natalie Portman from the for Vendetta. Yeah, she's just like, hey, look, I'm going for it. Like, it's just uh, so much freer this summer. On the way, don't Aren't you love you hot, it, bro? Right? <laughs> yeah. Want to hook up? Oh, you don't? Okay. Why yeah. not? <laughs> Why okay. Not? <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks to Kyle. Thanks to Steve. Thanks to Wargon. Check out our show on YouTube. It's the Ryan Russell podcast. Ringer Spotify.